is almost unacceptable in today's society by today's standards. And you know, as I was going through the verses that were relating to our verse uh, in Matthew and the Beatitudes, one of the ones that stuck with me was in 1 Peter. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. I think the idea of being pure in heart relates so much to love. And maybe, maybe nowadays we're just, we're not used to seeing or feeling love. You know, maybe that's one of the reasons why being pure in heart just isn't looked well upon because we're not used to seeing and feeling people's love in that way. Parents, for your children, your children look up to you and love you in ways that it's just, it's absolutely amazing. And I, I, you guys love your children just the same way, even, even if they annoy you. I ask my mom that all the time if, if I annoyed her too much for her to love me, but she always denies it. I think she's lying to me. Um, but anyways, that love, that simple pure love from a child, that love that you feel when you're looking at your child, that love that you have for your siblings even when they irritate you, that's what pure love can look like. And we're never going to be perfect at it. You know, the only true pure love comes from Jesus, but as imitators of Jesus and as people that are walking the way that he walked to live that kingdom life, we are called to love purely. So let's pray that in our hearts, that is the one thing that we feel, true and purifying love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for how much you love us and for your pure, undefined, unending love, Lord. I pray that in our daily interactions with those around us, that we would be able to show them that purity in our heart, that love that exists there. I pray that first and foremost for our, for our families and for our friends and for the people that we may not even feel called to love, even though we are called to love everyone. I pray that we'd be able to show them that pure love from you, Lord. And as we take this communion together, I pray that you would showcase to us how your purity and love is exemplified in your sacrifice to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So in taking together this communion, one of the other portions of communion has always been giving. You're taking something, you're receiving something from God. And he often calls us to give back in some ways. And the, the generic way of, of saying that is, you know, it's, it's, it's monetarily. But that love that he gives to us, that pure love, is something that, he calls us to reflect to others as well. But I pray that as you 
as you sit here today, that you would allow God to touch your heart on how it is that he would like you to give. If it's monetarily, there is a, um, an offering plate in the back. Um, you can also donate online uh, at temperchurch.org, I believe. Yeah. Um, and at other times, if you feel led to, to give your time, to give your energy to something, whatever it is that he's calling you into giving, I pray that you would answer his call. So let's pray. God, we thank you that you've given us a place where we can give, Lord. We can give to you. We can give to others around us. I pray that we would never take that for granted. I pray for your blessing over anything that we do give, whether or not it be time, money, effort, prayers. I pray that as we leave here today, that you would give us your blessing of peace. It's your name we pray. Amen. So if all of the kids oh. <laughs> So if all of the kids want to come up, you're welcome to come up and just kind of spread out over here. You can sit on the stairs or sit in chairs if you'd like to. But this is your special time. And so we're going to kind of let everyone know what we're going to do inside or and then we're going to go outside and have an activity together. So our memory verse for today is blessed of the pure of heart for they shall see God. This is a beautiful invitation to us. And the invitation is that, an invitation to come and see God. And this is really kind of difficult. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome. So glad you guys are here. Yeah. And so, to be honest, for me, this is kind of a difficult one. Because to be pure of heart is to be like God. It's to want good. It's to see good. It's to seek good. It's to be generous, to be kind, and to be all these things all the time. So it's, it's, this, it's this challenge, right? Because we're not naturally all these things. But the more we spend time with God, the more we look for him, the more we talk to him, and the more we practice speaking kindly, listening to God, um, wanting his best for the people around us, the more it becomes natural, the more our hearts begin to change, and the more we begin to see God. And so today we're going to practice this together. We're going to practice using words that help us to love each other as well. And as we practice to use these words, we it's kind of this act of choosing words that are good for other people. Because we can choose words that are really unkind, right? Has anyone ever chosen to say something unkind? Anyone? Adults? Anyone ever chosen to say something unkind? I don't want to eat my vegetables. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to eat my vegetables. <laughs> yeah. Like, sometimes we, you know, we're hurt, or we're sad, or we're just not being very kind, and we say things. But that is a choice. And so God invites us into a new way of loving people. And I want to kind of have this time to think about how can we choose words, how can we choose actions that build us towards this, that help us practice this purity of heart and help us practice this invitation to be a part of God's kingdom. Yeah. So we are going to make Valentine's because it's Valentine's Day. And because it's this idea of how can we share this love and how can we practice this love. So uh, for our families at home, if you want to create these Valentines with us, first the kids are going to create a Valentine for God. And the idea of this is to think about all of the best words, all of the best things that we want to talk about with God and to write it on that Valentine or draw it or create something and to really like sit with God and ask him to, think, to, think, to, to create with us this Valentine's. And also the things that are hard for us to have
have that conversation with your kids. And then after you've done that, you can spend some time making Valentines and practicing this purity of heart with others by giving these Valentines to their friends, to their siblings, to the rest of their family members. Yeah. So we're going to head outside and have some fun making Valentines. All right. Thank you. Guys, I'm so sorry. I didn't wish you all happy Valentine's Day this morning. <laughs> happy Valentine's Day. Um, all right. So many kids this morning. So cute. <laughs> all right. Um, we have one last song this morning. Um, and this song is a song of praise to God that he is the breath in our lungs um, he is the reason we can go and come. He's the reason we can sing, speak, shout. And so, again, remain in whatever posture you would like, standing or sitting, arms open, arms in the air. If, you, if you've seen that comedy act, it's like television, hold something, hold my baby, whatever. Uh, anyway, whatever you, posture you feel um, to remain in, um, you are welcome to get into that posture. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, Lord. It's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. Shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, will cry, these bones will sing, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in all
you all may be seated. our series today through the Sermon on the Mount. We're calling this series Where Jesus is King because we want to really paint a picture and live into this reality of what it means for Jesus to truly be Lord, for we to be his disciples, his students, his followers who take very seriously what Jesus says. As was mentioned earlier, I think at the children's message, uh, this beatitude today, I think, is, is a challenge. It's hard. Uh, and so I, I always think that maybe I'm getting into the right place when I'm struggling to know what to say about a given passage because you feel the weight of it. It's serious. It's worth talking about. We want to wrestle and not too easily think, oh, yeah, I know how to talk about pure in heart. And so I'm grateful for a time with God this week to sit at the feet of Jesus once again and learn. And I pray our time together will be a time of learning, something we can truly live out together. So Matthew 5, verse 8, is where we begin today. Blessed are people who have pure hearts, because they will see God. Tell me if you've ever experienced bader meinhof phenomenon, or you might call it something more like frequency bias. And if you're still not connecting to that, the idea is you bought a car that's yellow and suddenly you notice yellow cars. Have you ever had this happen to you? You learn a new word and suddenly everybody is using this word and you have never heard this word before in your life, or at least so you think. You hear a song on the radio and then you can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's this idea that now that I'm alerted to something, its presence around me has come alive, and it is now noticeable. They say that our brains can very easily filter out information that doesn't seem vital, and this is why we go throughout most of our lives not noticing things until we do, and then we can't not notice these things anymore. A while back, I shared with you about the study they did, and they asked people to just count how many times teams threw the ball back and forth. And you might remember, if you've heard this story, that as People counted, whoa, they threw it about 11 times. Great, great, good for you. That's right, they did throw it 11 times. Did you notice the gorilla? And people would just be like, what? There was, there was, no, there wasn't a gorilla. And they would play the tape back. There would be a person that just obviously walked through the game, dressed as a gorilla, as people threw the ball around. And people were so busy counting, because they were looking for that, that they missed this obvious and odd circumstance that was introduced to the game. Kind of the upshot of this test was to show that we see what we're looking for. We tend to see what we're looking for. And we don't see everything else, which is a lot. We miss a lot every day because we're just not looking for it. Our brains are not equipped to handle that kind of information. We have this very limited field of vision that we're operating out of each day. And so my question to you this morning is what are you looking for? What and how are you using this very limited field of vision that you have? What is it that you seek? Your brain can easily filter out information that does not seem vital to you. How have you been training your sight, your heart, your desires to see God? perhaps to filter out God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Jesus sits down on a mountain and he sees the crowd that surrounds him and he begins to speak blessing. And we've been looking at these blessings for the past several weeks and we're not in a hurry. The only hurry that I'm really in is I want to know Jesus more. So I don't really apologize for taking our time. I hope that this sitting with Jesus and each of these blessings has touched your heart in some way, that you have been able to receive some blessing from God in this time together. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. 
this crowd that surrounds Jesus, they all show up looking for something. They all have a need that is pressing on their heart, and they think, maybe this Jesus has something to say to me. Maybe he can do something about my problems. Maybe I can be blessed. Jesus responds. He blesses, and he simultaneously meets their needs, and as he meets these needs, he reorients our values. I think part of the reason why these blessings are so difficult for us to wrap our minds around is because we tend to list other people in the blessed categories. We have different ways of looking at people and saying, oh yes, good for them. They must be blessed by God. But Jesus introduces this different sort of list. And it's not exhaustive. I imagine if maybe there were different people in the crowd that day, that maybe the Beatitudes might be slightly different. But he speaks to these specific people and he meets their specific needs. And we sit longing for blessing at Jesus' feet today. I wonder if the mission of God could be summed up in one of these blessings. I think it might be our blessing today. The mission of God. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. They will see God. Jesus sees this crowd has surrounded him. They think they're looking for him. And I imagine Jesus sitting there thinking, I was looking for you first. And I am grateful that you found me. He is here in this moment handing out blessings because of this crowd. These are the people he came to find. The lost sheep that went wandering and needed care. Because God sees these people. He values these people the ones that we might not normally think are blessed. He says, blessed are you. And to see and value God in turn, should that not be my highest aim in life? Isn't this what we should all be pursuing more than anything else? God, we long to see you, to know you more intimately than we have yet. Perhaps that's the reason why our mission statement at this church is pursuing life with God together. That would be a really good mission statement, wouldn't it? If we really lived into that, wouldn't we be blessed if our life's goal was to see God? What other use of time and resources could be better than that? And still I wonder if we struggle to hear this as a blessing. I read this and I think, how could I read these words and not be excited? But it's not hard for me to imagine just reading this as a cold line and moving on to the next one and not being changed at all. Perhaps you don't see yourself as pure, and so these words to you are not helpful. Perhaps you see God as less than good, so to see God would not be all that good for you. Or perhaps we long to be part of this blessed community that is forming around the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And we tried that out, but we found the same old flaws that we found in the world. And we began to lose heart instead of growing in purity of heart. So if one or a combination of these issues has been an issue for you, I invite you to see Jesus. To meet this Savior that we have been listening to every week, every day for the last few years since I've been here and the years prior. Turn with me, if you will, over to the Gospel of John as Jesus calls another disciple. We talked a few weeks ago about the calling of Matthew and what that might have been like. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. This story of Jesus, I think, is helpful. John 1, 43 through 51. Jesus out gathering God's lost people. Starts in verse 43. This story reads like this. The next day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. He found Philip. Philip becomes one of the twelve. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. These are already disciples. Philip found Nathanael. And he said to him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets. Jesus, it's Joseph's son. He's from Nazareth. Nathanael responds, can any good thing come from Nazareth? 
Can anything from Nazareth be good? Philip says, well, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Here is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, Well, how do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you, you will see heaven open. God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth upon the human one, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. A few reasons why I love this story. Jesus greets Nathanael. Oh, here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. By the way, did you or did you not make fun of my hometown? It seems to me that there's something in Jesus greeting to Nathanael that lets him know he knows more about Nathanael than Nathanael would like for him to know. By the way, I heard what you said. I saw where you were sitting. I know all about you, Nathanael. So if this is you, do you feel real good right now in the presence of Jesus, or are you a little nervous? I wonder if Nathanael is a little bit embarrassed, a little bit nervous, and so he responds the only way he knows how. Oh, truly, the Son of God, this guy knows all about me. Time to play nice. I heard what you said, Nathaniel, and I know the whole story. A son of Israel. You might remember that before Israel was Israel, his name was Jacob. This Israelite in whom there is no deceit, his great-grandfather Jacob, name meaning the deceiver, truly lived up to that name. Very quickly, the story of the deceiver Jacob. He cheats his brother out of his birthright. He manipulates his father into giving him the blessing. So Esau's hurt twice now. The father's been lied to and manipulated. Jacob has to run, take his life in his own hands and run because somebody's going to take his life from him if he doesn't leave town soon. This is the kind of person Jacob is. And yet his life begins to turn when he catches a vision of God where angels are coming up and down, and he says, oh, this is the house of God, Bethel. This is the doorway to heaven. And Jesus says, you'll get the same as Jacob, that deceiver who got made right with God because of this vision. His life gets better from there. And it seems that Jesus is making this promise to Nathaniel as well. I know your heart may not be perfectly pure right now. We're going to get there together. Do we have this beautiful image? Have you had a beautiful vision of God that was so beautiful you could not help but live better and differently than you did before? Even though not quite perfectly yet. We read this word pure and it can be so intimidating because we know we are not that word. Yet purity here is not so much a moral statement, although how we live cannot really be pulled out of it. It's going to follow suit. But purity here seems to be this single-minded focus. My energy will be directed this way, as best as I humanly possibly can. My undiluted, clear vision, my thinking will be rightly directed towards God. And people who long to see God and put their life's energy into that, Jesus says, here's a promise. You will see me. Because this is how God sees. This is what God values. God has a purity of purpose for you. And you can believe that. I appreciate any time I'm quoted in a prayer, Travis. But it was a little bit of a misquote. Because God is not a threat to you. God is a threat to what threatens you. He is for us. And I don't know if that sounds controversial to you, but it shouldn't. This is the God who would do anything for you. God has that kind of purity of purpose for you. He is working for you. He's blessing us often in spite of ourselves. He continues to turn evil on its head because he has that kind of love for us. 
even when we have been ones contributing to that evil, God is working to make that evil different, to bring beauty out of it. He's looking for a way to bless. This is Jesus at the cross. Jesus, pure in heart, single-minded in purpose, to where even though he doesn't want to go to the cross, he says, I will do it for you, I will do it for them. And the cross, like the Sermon on the Mount, blessing all he sees, begins this gravitational pull. This isn't actually my favorite analogy, but come up with a better one and, and give it to me and I'll preach it. But this, this pull is subtle, but there. It doesn't go away. So subtle that most days we don't even feel it, even though it's operating on us. This is the love of God through Jesus at the cross. But it's still attractive. And every so often we do notice. It catches our attention. We begin to live with an awareness that we cannot not have anymore. The singleness of purpose. So we said, we ought to be pursuing life with God together. Where we hold up Jesus, the Christ of the church, and nothing else. How we talk about God, how we talk about Jesus, how we talk about church, these things betray our values. They show our beliefs for what they are. Good, less than good. How we talk shape our life. They shape our vision. It's important. Did you know that how you talk will shape your experience of the actual world? They think, they study, studies show, that many ancient cultures didn't have a word for the color blue. So even though they saw blue, they didn't know they saw blue. And so they would describe the sky as something like green, and the seas as something like wine dark. They see it, but it's like this categorical color blindness. They've been just trained to not fully recognize what they're looking at. And I wonder if we do that with God sometimes. The way we talk about God can limit or enhance our experience of how true and beautiful God is. So I wonder, what if we embrace this blessing of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is handing out so freely? Would it change our hearts and lives? Would it lead us to repentance? Would it help us raise our sights to see more clearly? If we have limited vision and we have to decide what to go looking for, make sure that the what is not a what, but a who. That we are looking for God himself. Because God says, if you seek me, you will find me. I am not far from anyone. Travis read for us earlier, to the pure, all things are pure. And I don't think this is a type of confirmation bias. This is people whose hearts have been changed to notice, and to be aware that God is here. He is in our midst. The kingdom of heaven has already arrived, and we need to alert people so that they can get in on this too. I think if we live out of this place of pure devotion to God, where we say we will do our best with what we have to give to you, God, to see you at work, we might start noticing God at work everywhere. We will find that we are not the first to bring Jesus anywhere because he already got there ahead of us. We just got to see what he was doing and point it out and join in. When we develop this singleness of purpose, we develop this union with the mission of God. And that is simply this, to see and be seen, to improve our connection with the divine creator. Our lives would become a blessing to those in need. We would see God and alert others to God's presence. And maybe they would catch a glimpse of God in us. So the mission of this church is to hold up Jesus, to pursue life with God together. To be pure of heart so that we too might see God. May we be successful, if not perfect, in that mission. Caroline, I believe, is going to say a prayer for us. Would you please pray for our efforts in this direction, that God would help us, and that through the Spirit, our hearts would be made pure, that we would have a vision of this beautiful God 
and give up anything that is less than that. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We pray that you will open our eyes to see these blessings, that you will help us reorient our perspectives towards you. Help us train our hearts, our minds, and our sight to see you first and so that others might see the love that you've given all of us through our actions and our words. Please bless us as we go into this coming week and to be representative of who you are in all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning to those of you who are with us here in person and to our friends here on Zoom and those who will be watching later. Thank you so much for joining us. A special thank you to our guests who are here for the first time. I hope that you feel encouraged and welcomed and please stick around and give us an opportunity to connect with you more after our service. We have a couple upcoming events and a more opportunities to stay connected with one another. So I want to let you know that next Sunday at 845, we're going to have a special, um, a special class that happens once every month. And it's where we look more deeply at the Lord's Prayer as we're studying the Sermon on the Mount together. So join us here at 845, or you can also log in on Zoom and join us through Zoom. And please register for that. You can find that link on our website, tempechurch.org slash events. We also have our art salon this Saturday, which is open to everyone. And we'd love to have you in the Oasis backyard. It's just right there next door to us. And Malika has prepared a wonderful afternoon for us to think more deeply about God, about God's invitation into, into creative thinking and ways of exploring art and creativity and beauty together. And so please join us for that this Saturday. Also, again, we are beginning a new season of small groups, and we would love to have you be connected to one of those groups. Some will meet in person, some will meet on Zoom. So if you're not plugged in somewhere to a group, please, please, please see Michael today to get plugged in. They're going to be studying Randy Harris's Living Jesus book, which is this great reflection on the Sermon on the Mount. And you can see Michael, that's him right there, if you want to sign up today for one of those small groups. And just a reminder that our Wednesday morning group meets on Google Meet every week on Wednesdays at 1030, I think it is, 10, 10 o'clock. And that is a great group that's already meeting right now. So if you're interested in joining that community, please also see Michael today and he'll get you to connect to that group. Thank you so much again for being with us. I hope you stay and connect with someone new today. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. You are dismissed. Hello. 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 <laughs> hello. Who's hello. Here? Hello, Anaya.